All right. Hi, everybody. We will call this meeting to order on February 8th, 2024, 7 p.m. start time. And we are beginning with approving the minutes. So Catalina, Michael, Kathy, have you had a chance to look at the minutes from the meeting? Oh, sent out. Right. Any questions? Any need for any changes? Nope. All right. So let's vote if we approve. So make a motion to approve the uh, meeting I, minutes. I make a motion to approve the minutes. Right. Yeah. We need a second. Second. All right. <laughs> Thanks. And let's take the vote. Aye. All right. Great. So we have a special guest coming today. Uh, Sasha Adkins is a senior lecturer over at UMass. And uh, they are in the environmental health sciences department over at the university. Uh, and Sasha is quite an expert on this. Uh, Sasha teaches a number of classes for um, undergrads. I don't know, uh, Sasha, if you can hear me. I hope you can. Do you teach any grad classes? Not yet at UMass, Not yet but at I UMass. did at Loyola. All right. So, um, Sasha, here we are. We're ready to go. Thank you. I think we'll have to... Oh, maybe you did mute. I was hearing an echo. All right. Thank you so much for having me tonight. I really appreciate the chance to talk with you. I'm sorry I'm not there in person. I am immunocompromised, so I'm really careful about going to spaces um, indoors. But I will share my screen and begin some slides. Yeah, right. And then leave some time for us to have a conversation. Are you able to see the slides? Perfectly. Thank you. So the connection between plastics and climate change is getting a lot more press, which I think is a positive development. And one of the big reports to come out was from Beyond Plastics, saying that plastics will outpace coal in driving climate change. And a lot of that is because, as you know, I'm sure, the fossil fuel industry is using plastics to subsidize falling revenues for oil and gas and coal. So obviously this will have indirect impacts on human health, but I'd like to focus tonight on direct impacts of plastic on human health. A study by Leo Trasande and his colleagues came out recently um, estimating that just in the United States, $249 billion are lost each year to diseases attributable to plastics. And they're just studying three of the thousands of chemicals in plastics. And just those three amounted to 249 billion a year in the US alone. I'm sure you've heard that plastics have now been found in human placenta on the baby side, in breast milk, in human lung tissue, and in the blood of almost everyone who's been tested as well as in our stool. So this study was interesting because they were characterizing the types of plastic that are most abundant in our poop. And they found polyethylene terephthalate, which is used to make single use plastic water bottles and polypropylene, which is used to make yogurt containers. So what goes in goes out and on the way it causes harm. But I want to note that those of us who drink from plastic water bottles are getting twice as many micro and nanoplastics as those of us who drink tap water. So a study just came out showing 240,000 pieces of plastic in the water in just one liter. One of the areas of research is uh, microplastics shifting the gut microbiome. So an artificial gut was created and fed donor poop. And the species 
of microbes that were resident in the artificial gut changed. The healthy ones decreased and unhealthy species increased. And so based on what we've seen in wildlife, studies in birds that showed the same thing, it looks like the presence of the plastic, no matter what its type, just the physical presence of these microplastic bits is causing our microbiome to um, shift in an unhealthy direction. It also alters the permeability of the intestine, leading to leaky gut syndrome, which is associated with um, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's, celiac, and studies have shown that the more plastic in your poop, the more likely you are to have celiac, Crohn's, or inflammatory bowel diseases. The microplastics also are toxic to kidney cells. So studies in the lab that expose kidney cells to micro and nanoplastics are showing that 76 to 77% of them die after exposure to these plastics. So it's been common to say, okay, some plastics are harmful, but others are okay. But that's actually not the full story. So these are the resin codes, which by the way are not recycling codes, that just show what the main ingredient of each plastic is. About half of plastics are additives. So the main ingredient is just one piece of the puzzle. But some of these main ingredients on their own are very harmful. We saw a year ago in East Palestine, in Ohio, where the train derailed and it spilled polyvinyl chloride. That is known to be a carcinogen, and it has another unusual effect. I'm not sure from where you're sitting, are you able to see the black lines at the tip of the worker's fingers? Yes. So, thank you. The worker <laughs> handles vinyl chloride, and the vinyl chloride is causing his bones to be resorbed. So basically the bones are dissolving in his fingers. And with continued exposure, he'll lose more bone. This is known to be caused by vinyl chloride. So the name of this condition is occupational acroosteolysis, dissolving of the bones, osteolysis, and occupational because it's, it's in vinyl chloride workers. It also causes uh, a rare liver cancer, angiosarcoma of the liver, and is an endocrine disruptor and many other issues. I'm going to go back for a moment so we can see that vinyl chloride is number three, the main ingredient of PVC. We can also see that number six, polystyrene, is made of styrene, which also is known to be harmful to health on its own. And the monomer or building block for number seven, which if it's polycarbonate is made of BPA. You may have heard of that bisphenol A, which is a synthetic estrogen and also extremely hazardous to our health at very low levels, parts per thousand. So that leaves us with what? Polyethylenes, numbers one and two, and four, and polypropylene, which you recall from the earlier slide, is abundant in our stool. These are not, at this time, known to be hazardous monomers, hazardous building blocks, but there are often additives in numbers one, two, four, and five that create problems for our health. This is a list of some of the additives. These are used in vinyl chloride, um, and these are just a few. 
And you'll recognize some things here, I'm sure. Lead and phthalates, azo-based dyes, which are carcinogens. Lots of things that we would really be um, shocked at if we saw them um, listed on a label. But of course, these are proprietary. So it's a trade secret. And even when the vinyl chloride is used as food packaging, as consumers, we don't have a right to know what's in it. So number five, polypropylene, was used in lab equipment for an experiment on brain cells. And the researchers found that the brain cells wouldn't survive in the polycarbonate plastic. They realized that it was leaching quaternary ammonium biocides, which are used as a um, disinfectant. Now in this era of COVID, they're in many, many spaces, including this, the schools where I teach. And oleamide, which is a normally occurring substance in our skin, but the synthetic version is apparently toxic to brain cells. So they wrote an emergency alert to the journal Science. And they said, if this is killing brain cells, maybe we should rethink using it as food packaging. But no legal action was taken. There was no policy change. And this was way back, 2008. So a lot of people these days are putting hope in bio-based, plant-based, biodegradable plastics. But my colleague Martin Wagner and his research team showed that they are not necessarily safer. Yeah. And that includes yeah. polylactic acid, PLA, which is what this bio cup is made of. That was actually, the PLA was more toxic than fossil fuel-based conventional plastics. So that's what's in the plastic on purpose, but then there's a whole nother universe of contaminants. And this is what I studied for my PhD research. Um, when the plastics are circulating through the environment, they pick up other poisons because Many of the persistent, meaning that they don't break down organic pollutants, love oily, fatty substances. And plastics fit the bill because they're made from oil and gas. So lipophilic or fat-loving compounds will bind to them. One of the first studies that really blew my mind and shaped my research trajectory was done in Tokyo. Um, Yukiemato submerged various plastic beads that were brand new in a stainless steel mesh net into Tokyo Bay. She had tested them before she put them in the water and they did not have these contaminants, PCBs and PAHs and... Um, DDT, but after she soaked them in the ocean for two weeks, the levels of these harmful pesticides and, and toxicants was a million times higher than the level of those chemicals in the seawater. So they act like a filter, soaking them up very efficiently so that they're no longer in the seawater. And that would be great if we could then take them out and dispose of them somehow. But instead, it's, of course, entering the food web. And so for my research, I looked at mercury. I figured maybe the reason that Yuki Emato's work and Emma Tutin and others wasn't getting attention is because people are less familiar with PCBs, unless you're in the Berkshires, right? GE contaminated the Housatonic and... Uh, People are very concerned about PCBs there, but um, they aren't familiar with PAHs like phenanthrene or DDT. It used to be a thing. People now may not know it. 
So I was like, what are people afraid of? Mercury. Everybody's scared of mercury in their fish. So I demonstrated that plastic also attracts and binds mercury very efficiently. Mm -hmm. And then when the fish eat the plastics, I am guessing that that is concentrating it in the fish. Um, so it's it's more than biomagnification. I call it plastic mediated magnification. We can't begin to characterize all of the contaminants that are sticking to the plastic. So that's the health side. So then the question is, where is all this coming from? And it's not actually litter. It's not actually a problem of quote unquote mismanaged plastic waste. In the oceans, most of the plastic is from clothing. So these are microfibers that are in most clothing that isn't natural, which would be wool, cotton, hemp, linen, silk, leather. If it's not those things, bamboo is kind of sketchy, um, then it's probably lycra, polyester, spandex, nylon, acrylic, even vinyl, etc. Like these toxic uniforms that Alden Wicker wrote about in her excellent book that I highly recommend to die for. Um, these microfibers from our clothing have been found in rainwater. They're circulating everywhere. And there's a campaign in California to encourage people to have filters on their washing machine so that the microfibers are captured and sent to a landfill instead of directly out into the waters. I would prefer that we make fewer synthetic garments and more out of natural fibers instead. But another source that is one of the major sources in the oceans of plastic pollution is our tires, tire dust. And the tire dust contains 6-PPD quinone, which is extremely toxic for some species of salmon. So this is an emerging contaminant of concern. But most of the single-use plastic that is wasted is happening in ways that are invisible to us as consumers. We don't see it littered around. Um, but I've seen statistics that 90% of single-use plastic is in the supply chain before it reaches us. Silly example, and it's quite close to us in the supply chain, but where I used to teach at Loyola University in Chicago, there was a green eco-friendly cafe in the greenhouse on campus, and they served exactly the same Aramark food that they served at all the other cafes on campus. But for the green cafe, they took it out of the packaging first before they displayed it in their display case. So we went there, out, we would go out of our way to go there because we thought we were getting something without plastic packaging, but they'd simply unpackaged it for the display and thrown it away behind the counter. But that's a metaphor for what's actually happening. So one of the things I'm really interested in learning more about from all of you, because I understand that um, farmers are represented here, is plasticulture. I understand that our focus is shifting from plastics in the ocean to plastics on land. And what I see in my side doing research on the chemicals in it and hormone disruption is that there is hormone disruption happening in plants. Um, bisphenol A, for example, that synthetic estrogen in number seven plastic, polycarbonate, which is often what, greenhouses, is um, absorbed by fruits and vegetables grown in a greenhouse with polycarbonate panels. And it can disrupt estrogen signaling in the rhizome, the roots of plants. So there's emerging research happening on 
impacts on specific plants, but we don't have a sense yet of the big picture. A lot of us in this field have started looking at biosolids, especially with um, concerns being raised about PFAS, the forever chemicals like Teflon that are ruining a lot of farms in Maine. Songbird Farm is one example. Um, they used this biosolid as a soil amendment and then the levels of PFAS in the crops that they grew were too high for them to sell them. So they had to stop farming. And now the land is being used as a testing ground for different experiments and how to remediate the soil. But we've also got lots of plastic in the biosolids. If you're not familiar with the term, it's it's dried poop from wastewater treatment plants and it's it's sold as compost. Chicago, where I was living, had a, a big problem with this where they realized that a lot of the public lands where they'd spread it were now in need of remediation. So what is this doing to the microbes in the soil? These kinds of questions are being asked. Um, and then what are the emissions as they break down? So this plastic mulching sheeting material Low density polyethylene um, has greenhouse gas emissions. I don't know how significant they are compared to other sources like transit and you know power generation. But um, what is this doing to the plants and to the soil? And are there alternatives? So this is what I had hoped to hear from all of you. I will stop sharing the slides so we can see each other better and open for discussion. Sure, we'll start it with the committee and what our experiences have been, and then we can open it up to other people. So Michael, I'm just wondering your experience as a farmer, did you use plastics as part of your operation? Um, we tried real hard not to use it in the field and to rely on cultivation instead. Um, but um, between my root business and the tortilla business, I'm probably one of the bigger plastic consumers in the state. And um, I don't like that. And I've known for years that plastic's killing us. I, I still have some questions about that. But um, I don't know what else to do. I don't know what other substances exist. The fake plastics are just that. They're fake. They don't work. And they have, turns out, medical issues as well. So it's a big problem, but we got to come up with a solution before we can say we're not mm -hmm. going to use this. Because, um, I, And the other thing that I, I, I'm, I'm concerned about is that, that um, the case has been made that they're bigger, that plastics are a bigger pollution than pollute a uh, bigger carbon contributor than coal. And uh, I don't know what that means. Um, and I also am concerned that 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 any study that claims that probably doesn't calculate the cost of food spoilage and food transit that would be through the roof once we eliminate these plastics, what which while they are killing us, they're also allowing us to move things around really inexpensively from a financial and an energy point of view. Yeah. So we're screwed. I, that's uh, let you come up with something else. That's that's what we're doing. And Kathy, just wondering about your experiences. Same, just driving around town, you see plastic mulch down. I mean, it's convenient saves on labor, saves on chemicals, right? That's was the idea behind it. Like instead of and using fuel. the pesticides, right? Yeah. Right. Catalina? No. no. Thank you. We can open it up to the bigger audience and just wondering, we have some farmers in the audience. So, so go ahead. What Mark. is biodegradable plastic? What's the difference between that and regular plastic? So Sasha, could you hear all right? 
Yeah, biogre biodegradable plastic. Yeah. There's lawsuits happening right now because technically any plastic will biodegrade, but the time scale is hundreds or thousands of years. Like we really don't know how long it would take to break down. Plastic breaks apart into smaller pieces with the sun and the wind and the rain, but those pieces are still the polymers. And so how, how do those polymers break down? So California, for example, is banning the use of the term biodegradable because it does not mean that it's safe to put it outside and it will break down in, in months. It doesn't mean that consumers are misled. Mm -hmm. And so there are some microbes that eat plastics. They've been found and isolated in the lab, but it it's not going to happen at a scale that would break down litter on the side of the road, for example. So things that go in the compost, for a while they were just regular plastics like polyethylene linked with cornstarch. So it would look like they're disappearing. It would look like they're biodegrading because it breaks into small enough bits that we can't see it clearly, but they're still polyethylene molecules. And so they're still toxic. And in fact, the smaller they get, the more easily they're in the food web. So that term is what I would call greenwashing in most cases. And it's illegal to use the term now to describe plastics in at least California. Any follow up on that? I'm just surprised to hear this. Yeah. So going back, Michael, to your question, you have a need. Mm -hmm. And right now there's really no substitute. Uh, I mean, I, something I've thought about a lot. And, you know, if, if I no longer grow root crops, Resendo Santiz has taken over that business. But if we brought our product to the supermarket and it didn't have was not wrapped in plastic, it would shrivel up in a few days and be done. New story. Send them another bag the next day. I'm sorry, send them some more <laughs> roots the next day because they're just going to shrivel up and die. Uh, and, and, and perhaps, you know, maybe there's a way to completely change the humidity levels in across the entire supply chain. So that plastics wouldn't be needed, and 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 I mean the current refrigeration just dehydrates everything. That's what it does. Um, but if if you know maybe there's a way to pump in huge amounts of humidity, and then you you could use more bulk distribution of, of, of vegetables, for example. Um, you know that might solve some problems, but you, you know, a long way off from that. Yeah. So it seems like a lot of the farmers are kind of caught in the struggle of consumers want the product to look good, at least acceptable. Um, and so stores are saying use plastics. Mm -hmm. It's not even a question of looking good. I mean, I, that's a whole other thing. There's a lot of things that farmers have to do because consumers want things to look perfect. But this is a question of it keeping for, you know, two days versus three weeks. Yeah. You know, it's the question of. You know, our, our supply chains aren't designed to, like, move things right to the person's table like that anymore in a day. Mm -hmm. So, Sasha, in all of your research, have you found any places that are finding solutions to issues like Michael is bringing up? Yeah. So I'm aware that FDA has approved, and this is not a solution, um, different polymers, essentially plastics that are used as coatings on fruits so that they can retain their moisture and not degrade um, in the time that they need to be transported to the consumer. And one of them was um, a vinyl lighting copolymer, which is quite similar to saran wrap, but it's, it's a part of the fruit. It's not wrapped around it in a way you can unwrap. It's like baked onto it. So, we're going in an interesting direction there, but there have been some companies making um, biodegradable, I'll use the term now, sir, biodegradable 
plant-based waxes and such that would coat, but um, I'm not sure that's, as a consumer, that's what I would want. I know that I put my produce into a stainless steel airtight container and it keeps much, much longer than it does even in the plastic bags. And I know that um, San Francisco has started moving towards um, deposit systems on these stainless steel containers for to-go. I wonder if it is possible. This would be a huge expenditure up front um, to set up the infrastructure. But to have, like, we have pallets that can be reused. Some of them, they're plastic pallets, right, that you get back to reuse. If we could have containers for the transport that were reusable, what do you think about that? Well, there's huge, like, toxic loads in the manufacture of stainless steel. It's one of the most polluting industries you can think of. So, mm -hmm. you know, we as a consumer, we're going to buy something. We have to, we have to. We have to figure out what leaves the lightest imprint on the earth. And, you know, it could be plastic. <laughs> because the the fact of the matter is we consume a lot. And until we figure out how not to consume so damn much, you know, we have to, anyway. Yeah. So I, I heard you say earlier that the uh, data wasn't in about whether or not bamboo was a good substance. Yeah. So I have things that are bamboo fleece that are made by organic all natural companies, but, um, and I thought that that was a good alternative. It turns out there's different ways to process the bamboo and some are more harmful than others. Some people are processing the bamboo with lots of toxic chemicals and it becomes a, a mostly synthetic blend. So, so it, it's yeah. not the bamboo itself, it's it's processing. I was thinking yeah. it might have been something that the bamboo was absorbing through the atmosphere and soil into its right. system going to be the toxin. If you look at the bamboo product, the bamboo floor, and you look at a stalk of bamboo, it, it's plastic on the floor. Okay, that's bamboo on the stock. But we have we have bamboo sheets. It's kind of fun. They're really soft. Yeah. But I don't know what they did to get them there. <laughs> and then I think about all the kudzu. And could we use that to make paper <laughs> products? And use kudzu liners for your fields under the corn or as, as your, you know, I don't know. I think we have to go back to paper, but it has to be a regenerable supply. Have you found any alternatives for regular plastic in the fields? No. And for 20 years, they've been trying to get a system going. It's reusable plastic containers. So you, instead of buying a box, you rent this container, send it to the store, they sell it, then trucks pick up the empties, take it to a factory where they're sanitized, and then you, they come back to your farm. Mm -hmm. But it takes cooperation between a lot of stores, and it just doesn't happen. Mm. Well, that's like some breweries reselling the glass containers, yeah. and you can use them over that's and over. A, that's a plastic lug, right? It is indeed. But it collapses, so you can get a lot on the truck. Mm -hmm. But it's plastic. Goodness. Yeah. But it would be better to be reusing the plastic than creating it new. But you exactly. say that there's there's troubles with getting it safely sanitized and safely back and the cooperation it's, between all those. It's good logistics. Mm -hmm. And is it still leaching when you're putting food in it? It is. Yeah. Well, I wonder, Sasha, you know, so much of the yogurt that we eat comes in plastic containers and it doesn't seem super healthy to have it that way. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if we're going to be running into problems, you know, maybe that some of our plastic in our digestive system mm -hmm. is coming from the food we eat. Yeah. So I will out myself as a bit of a hippie. I lived in Missouri in an eco village and we used to go on our bicycles down the street to a dairy farm and we would get milk straight out of the udder 
from the cows on this organic dairy farm. And guess how it was coming out of the udders? Probably a plastic milking machine. PVC, yeah. Yes. And it, of course, it's warm coming out of the udder. But we would take that and we would make our own yogurt in glass containers. And we're like, wait a minute. It's still coming through PVC pipes. And, and who knows what the cow is is eating and exposed to in the field. And like, there is no... There is no way to segregate all the plastic yeah. from from us and our inside of us. If we're producing it, then it's going to become part of us. So I guess the questions are along the lines of we do need to get the produce fresh, maintain yeah. it safely and fresh to the consumer. I mean, there was an ad that the Plastics Council put out that said, you could think of plastics as the sixth major food group. And it was all about how important they are in this supply chain. How do we create a supply chain again? Because we had it before without that plastic. Um, it seems like what's shifted is the globalization. And this is, of course, I study chemicals. So now I'm just conjecturing, right? And yeah my guesses are no better than anyone else's but when it's local it's easier to to transport quickly and consume quickly and to get the the loop closed where containers could go back didn't they used to have a coke bottle facility locally i well, heard they still that. have it in northampton it's still running oh all we don't know for how much longer with the glass bottles getting reused uh I don't know if they're doing much glass anymore. Yeah. Now they've shifted to plastic. Yeah. Bother that they used to sanitize the bottles and they were all kept local. So we know how to do this. India does it with Tiffins, stainless steel lunch containers. And I do hear your concern about the toxicity and the, the impact of mining for these elements and making stainless steel. But they use stainless steel lunch boxes that, um, are taken by bicycle from housewives to their husbands at work and then sanitized and sent back so they get the same lunchbox back. It's mind-boggling to me how they manage that. And you see these bicycles with hundreds of, of lunchboxes stacked up on them. But it's reusable containers that are used over and over and over that circulate. It's possible. Um, for me... I think of the problem not being the material, the plastics, and what should we, what material should we replace it with? I think of disposable culture. So I actually come from a faith-based perspective, and I'm looking at how we are shaped by thinking of everything as only use value. We get in the habit with stuff of thinking that stuff is only good as long as it serves a purpose for us. Instead of my mama, my grandmother, who used to say, okay, well, it's, you know, it's got a hole in it now. It's not going to hold milk, but maybe it will hold coins and finding another use for things so that we have a relationship with things and we see their, their value, their purpose. That if we have that mindset instead of disposable culture, we don't see ourselves as disposable either. I see parallels in how we think of, of other people only by their use value. You know, we talk about folks who are elderly as no longer productive in all of this. I, I feel that if we change the way we interact with material objects, that it will shift the way we interact with each other. So... That's what I'm rooting for. So that Sasha, could you, share, could you share briefly what are some of the courses you're teaching at UMass this semester? Sure. Well, this semester I have two classes on climate change and health, and I'm also teaching water justice and planetary health and a class on critical thinking and uh, an interdisciplinary concentration in science, technology, engineering, and math. So that course is um, case studies. The students are looking at urban heat islands 
and they're from all different disciplines in STEM, computer science, engineering, et cetera. And they're trying to find solutions by working together in these teams with different perspectives. Um, but last term I taught environmental poisons and that's a, a class that I really enjoy where we get to go in depth about toxics and look for solutions. All right. Any other questions? Fascinating. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And you can contact opening me up our eyes to this. Yeah. I would love to keep the conversation going. So I hope that some of you will will email me or call me and we could set up a time to have coffee or tea and and chat in person. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. All right. Thanks. Thanks. For all of you in the audience, that's on YouTube if you want to refer back to it for anything. All right. Hmm. Oh. So moving along with the agenda, 4.1, the opt-in specialized stress code discussion. When last we met, we heard from Art and we heard from Chris and they were talking about opt-in specialized stretch code and just want to do a little history rewind here. If you're not aware, it was a couple of years ago, we were able to get the stretch code voted in in Hadley. And that was part of the Green Communities Initiative. This would be a different type of building code. And I'm just wondering, what are some of the things you took away from that, from that discussion last time? My primary takeaway from it was that um, I didn't find it very <laughs> enlightening. Maybe I wasn't paying enough attention, but it wasn't really clear specifically what the changes were. And my takeaway was that within a certain amount of time, it's all going to be the code anyway. And so it seemed like a waste of our time to ponder it at this point anyway, because why push the car a little faster when it's heading in that direction anyway? Yeah. Thanks. I agree. That was kind of my takeaway as well. As soon as he said it's going to unfold this way anyways, I'm not sure just moving ahead faster is really beneficial considering the small amount of building that we have going on. Yeah. You know, it's been interesting that there's been some news coverage lately about how few building permits have been pulled in Hadley. But there's a lot of reasons for that. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of it could have to do with building codes, but I think a lot of it has to do with high interest rates, with the cost of materials to build new construction. It's just, you know, I think things are down a little bit, Jane. If you're looking at housing, there aren't very many lots that are available. We have a lot of empty land as you look around, but it's an agricultural preservation mm -hmm. or it's wetlands. But they're out of the picture. So do you have any sense of how much of Hadley is left that's buildable? Very little. I, I heard the number, but it's yeah. not much. So it's going to be redevelopment as in terms of housing, affordable housing. It's going to hopefully be along Route 9 where we have the infrastructure with water and sewer. I Every time I drive by where Rockies and uh, Taylor Rental was, I think there's a property. All we need is to have zoning such that we can build there for the dwelling units that we need. Because there are many of the seniors that I talk to have kids who can't afford to live in Hadley anymore. We can't buy the houses. And the seniors themselves would like to have an apartment or some kind of a complex where they don't have the responsibility of their homes and their maintenance. And they can just go and have a life and, and still be in Hadley because this is where they've always been. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Catalina, any thoughts? Yeah. Uh, hang on, Peter. Just, what I, what I felt here. is like... Uh, uh, um, the, it's more apply, apl applicable to new things, to new buildings, mm -hmm. but for 
regular houses will be like, a, it will be hard and very expensive, like changing the windows, like triple thing, changing the whole uh, electricity, change, like the whole, to be able to upgrade to that level would yeah. be like a, out of the question. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because Kathy wrote up some notes. She's sort of our team expert on this, but a lot of this applies to new homes and less so on home renovations and things yes. like that. All right. So this is always when it's tricky um, as being chair or co-chair of this committee, because, you know, we're having the discussions, but we also know that there's some expertise in the audience. Mm -hmm. Peter, jump in with your question. You were asking as to how come less building is being done um, or when you're talking about the permits, yeah. correct? Uh, it, it just seems like in my field and the heating and air conditioning and the gas and the electrical and the building, you change a window, you need a building permit. You need to change the route. You put on a deck, it's a permit. It's permit after permit as to revenue towards the town, which goes towards uh, what's the value of your house. So I think a lot of it is that too is, okay, I'm building a deck that might be a $250 permit. What's the guesstimated value of the deck? That goes to towards your house, which then you're going to be taxed on your improvements to your house. Maybe that could be that too. You towns just love to be able to apply permits, which is income towards the towns. Think about it that way, and why there might be less permits. Maybe there sure are a lot of factors involved, and especially with um, the cost of building nowadays. Yeah. And with that, I mean, you're talking about with people that want to live in Hadley, it's a choice. They don't have to live in Hadley. They can live wherever they want. So, I mean, if they can't afford it, if, you know, if, however you're living or wherever you're living, if you can save enough money to living in Hadley, that's your choice. So you can't go about and have housing for somebody because somebody's kid wants to live in town. Save your money. If you can't afford it, you live somewhere else, make your money. Spit, sell that house and make money of buying a house in Hadley. We can't just say, oh, well, my kid wants to live in Hadley. Um, it's not fair. You know, it's not fair, but our taxes are great. Our taxes are great. Everybody wants to come here because we're in between Northampton and Amherst. Great views. Taxes are low. That's why to buying a house, it's going to be sold very quick. Well, and schools have a good reputation. And the schools are good. So it's it's more or less of a choice if you want to live in Hadley, not just because you want to, because you grew up there all your whole life. Sometimes you got to have to earn it to live where you want to live. I think we are talking about uh, the, the, the um, lecture that we have last time. Yes. Yes. So if we can Last time with... lecture, because also yeah. one thing we didn't do right. is to have a vote. Yeah. Of if we want to move this opt-in specialized stretch code forward, or but, do, oh, I but I'm hearing yes. certain things from all of you. Right. I would like to move that we do not move it forward. Okay. Yeah. Whatever that means. Well, <laughs> and you need somebody to second that? I second that, right. Okay. I second. And it's time for a vote. Um, this vote is to decide on whether or not to move it forward to the select board. Mm -hmm. And it's time to vote now. So. Yeah. If we want to um, not move it forward, raise your hand. Aye. All right. Yep. Okay. And next, it brings us to the farm roundtable conversation. Um, when we came in last meeting, there was talk of having a few different agencies, some different groups in the valley um, being able to help us co-sponsor a farm round table, some of them have pulled back. So Barstow's, uh, they had been looking to do a, a um, round table with dairy farms, um, but there's also not a lot of dairy farms around here anymore. So they had some interest, but not a lot of interest. They've rescheduled theirs until the end of February, hoping that they can get some, some more farmers in. But if you look at how many dairy farms there are in Amherst, it's zero. In Hadley, there's a handful. Um, when it comes to the farm roundtable, that's something that could happen. And Wally, I wanted to open it up to you. 
what are you able to do when it comes to well, it, it can be at the barn yeah. and we could get people if it's during a day we could get representatives from different agencies what are you looking at for the best timing to do it and when would you think would be a good what do you think michael before people go out to the field for sure i would say before the end of march the way it's going this year we might be in the field Tomorrow. We were out there today and yeah. we wow. no which is stunning. Yeah. It's so February what do, you, what 8th. what do you think, Michael? By May, by March 15th. Yeah, as soon as it could be put together at this point. Yeah. I don't know how much putting together there's gonna be. It's just gonna be people coming and sharing. Well, what's your vision for this? I don't is there well when you advertise it, are you gonna say Come and share your thoughts on farming today as opposed to 10 years ago. Or I think you need a little bit of a focal point to aim people at what they're talking about. That sounds about. right, but how how are you going to cope with this year's upcoming weather? There you go. There's a, there's a conversation piece. I mean, look at what's going on right now. I have a daughter who lives in California. I'm hearing it. Oh, and I talked to a truck driver from Long Island. And his crocuses are up today. Well, I I have crocuses up. There you go. But I have a southeast corner. Mm -hmm. right. Do you have a particular time in mind, like a Thursday afternoon or something like that? Is there, I'm just thinking of what would be best for finding farmers before they're getting out into the field. I'm thinking Friday afternoon, yeah. <laughs> you're not bringing beer. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So, you're going to offer some food. And Alex, I'm wondering, is this something you would still be interested in yeah, recording? Just uh, send us the information when yeah. you guys have to solidify. Yeah. Can you just meet me? That's what we just Maybe mm -hmm. that could be complicated. All right. Yeah. That. So, Wally, um, I know Alex had put out that he would like to record it. And this is something that yeah. could be played for others? Yeah. I, to me, it doesn't matter. I don't know how other people feel about it. Do you think, Michael, anybody's have a problem with that? No. No. We got a shower in the barn. If we need it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think it's really good to spread the word. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, I, yeah. Don't, I don't know if it's possible, but I think one of the things that has the most impact for the local people and we have the CESA farms all invited because they deal with locals one-on-one -on -one as opposed to supplying businesses with their foods. Yeah. Do you have much of connection with CESA? Or? Yeah, sure, I could. If we have a date, I can certainly tell them. Yeah. Well, you want to pick a date? Uh, I don't have a calendar. Oh boy. Friday. Yeah. Why not? Perfect. Get your bees oh, yeah. in the ground and come on over. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay. okay. The Ides of March. What what day? March 15th. March 15th. What time? time? Uh three o'clock. Three o'clock. I'll be up for two. Okay. BYOB. <laughs> what do you think? Sounds good. Uh, let me make sure I'm still here then. Shirts and glass bottles. Right. Yes. <laughs> no, they might break. <laughs> You're not allowed to have glass on the farm. We're not we're not allowed to have glass on the farm, right? Yeah, I prefer a little more. But I mean, you're not allowed to have glass on the farm, right? I mean, our food processing, so we're not allowed to have glass there. That's right. You know, so it's, you know, wow. yeah, sorry, I'm getting sidetracked there. <laughs> I don't know if that's the time. All right, so the 15th, you might be we're doing it. I Sounds might. good. Yeah, All, right. Yeah, yeah. All right, so tentatively, March 15th at 3 p.m. All right, so they didn't work out well for Caesar, but hopefully it'll work out better for uh, <laughs> talking about dealing with the current weather so that's um thank you for being gracious about that that's a good opportunity yeah, nice to, get to some... offer the beer for everybody while is <laughs> how is it advertised we'll be talking about that. so <laughs> now we turn to jane and say how can we advertise that well we get a nice little write-up and i'll send you to scott and he'll put it in the set 
Okay. Do you want and graphics made? You can have something put on, on the um, town website. Okay. You can put signs. Who, who takes care of the town website? You see right behind me. I don't mean website, I mean um, table. Okay. I can work with Jennifer too. I'll put on, on so Jennifer has this thing that sometimes um, she'll blast out that there's some okay, sort of. So we can find out if this qualifies. Okay. We can say it's an urgent climate and discussion and relative to all Hadley residents. All right. Do you need more information to start working on the media blurb a little bit? Um, March 15th, 3 p.m., 135 Mount Dana. Address, yeah. Actually, email all that information. And uh, I'll get something out. I have it a few weeks ago. Hopefully, Jack will text to me and my phone won't die. So, okay. <laughs> this is what I like about technology. So what, what time did we say? Sorry. Free. Free. And is it possible to send an email that everybody has to send to all the people they know in Hadley and friends? Once we get the PR yeah. piece done, yeah. if you it can should be distributed to Facebook pages, neighborhood yeah. pages, whatever. But okay, thank you. Yes. That's the mm -hmm. best by far. Yeah, because I receive it. I have the email of all my neighbors, like 10 neighbors, like yeah. my close neighbors. Yeah. Oh, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And the cultural consultant. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I can make an announcement. That would be good. Thank you. Michael, solar conversation. Where are things at? Um, I know we had a chance to get together with the select board a while ago. Yeah, um, I don't have a lot to report at this point. Um, I did get numbers on on battery stuff. I really have had a very busy couple of weeks myself, and so I haven't had a chance to digest them. Um, Jane yeah. mentioned that you have two two presentations that we might be able to get from the MM, the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Municipal, Municipal Association. Association. Okay. So I actually have scheduled one, okay. with Carolyn and me and the representative next Tuesday on um, electric chargers for the library. Because they have always had that in their blueprint. Yeah. That was what they wanted to do. And there is now funding that it would come to the town at no cost. Wow. I need to see that before I sign on the bottom line. Well, let's say that again. It would come to the town at no cost? Correct. All right. So we need to know what that really means. Yeah. Because there has to be a cost. Mm -hmm. Who's paying? Right. So anyway. And then what about you, then, had, you wanted us to have another solar presentation as well? So I also met several people at MMA who do solar in for towns, as Michael has been talking about the landfill. And right now, one of the problems is it's budget season for the town. And that really is a complicated yeah. issue, especially with finances from the state down to support us. So everything's being, all the belts are being tightened and people are trying to figure out how to, how to fund the town to keep going. So yeah. that's a big focus right now. So it's hard to get in outside meetings, but occasionally you can pull it off. And ideally, we'd like to offer this committee's resources to try to develop yes. the project yes. so, that, that. so that the town doesn't have to have that focus. Well, that's the purpose is to be a referral, to do the research, you do the homework, then you bring it to the town. Yeah. It saves them doing it. Absolutely. Jim, I think that's a good idea when it comes to the charging for the library, but I think there needs to be, like you said, a course look to see who's paying for it. And then after, is this something that anybody and everybody, instead of going down the pride and not paying Tesla, that we're going to be paying for their... You would have to... So the way it works, as I understand it, is the user, if you bring your electric car, you have to pay for the electricity because it's coming from the town's electric... And town certainly not going to pay for you or me to charge my car. Mm -hmm. So it'll have a meter. You put your card in. Okay. I, I've never, I don't know how they work. So I'm glad meter, you put your charging you can card. And this is why I think there's another charge. You can charge 30 cents more than you pay per kilowatt hour. 
when you charge somebody for charging their car? Why do they let you do that? Is that like a user's fee? I don't know. I want to know. My sense is that's that you. that's the only incentive anybody would have for putting a really expensive charger yeah. at their place is that they would make a little money over time. So all the charges right. you see everywhere yeah. are making 30 cents a watt. Um, in this case, it sounds like there's some grants involved that's going to underwrite the cost. Yeah, $50,000 worth of equipment you can get for free. But I want to know, that's four charging stations. But I, and they are two instead of, they're not the fast ones, they're the two. Level twos. I looked that part up. But maybe they have a, I don't know. We, you know, there's a lot of information still to come. It's unlikely that they would be the fast chargers for free. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for reporting back. And thanks for the questions. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, spring cleanup. So we are looking at 420, Saturday 420 as the date for spring cleanup. So this involves a lot. Just know this for the future. Um, we contact Solid Waste. They run the transfer station and we get their prior approval that on that one day people can collect everything from the town. They don't need a dump sticker but they can go and they can drop off whatever they pick, the recycling and the trash bags. They've helped us for the last few years. Uh, they seem pretty open to the idea again. They just want an email and everything formalized. We would have April 27th as the alternate date. The reason I give an alternate date, last year we were snowed out. Mm -hmm. Last year, though, we also did it much earlier. We had done it before, end of April, early May, um, but then we ran into some problems with people getting bit by ticks, people catching poison ivy, all those things. So we backed it up. We backed it up pretty far. Yeah. And so now it's going to be close to Earth Day. Mm -hmm. When uh, is Earth Day? Earth Day is it's the 22nd. 22nd. Yep. Um, last year, Tandem Bagels came through uh, with plenty of snacks and I will check in with them. In addition, I will contact the Hadley Police Department, the Hadley Fire Department. I will contact Annie McKenzie, the superintendent of schools and check in, but I'll also check in, I think it's Ruth Ann Fitzgibbon who does the Pro Merido. Last year we had about 20 students wow. from Hopkins. We had never gotten students before because wow. this would be our fourth time doing the spring cleanup day. Mm -hmm. um, and it was great to get all the students. They spent their time on the rail trail and other places around town. Last year, Home Depot donated a lot of containers for picking up the trash. We don't need more containers this year. We still have some leftovers. Is uh, Home Depot the best place to meet or do you want to This year, what we're thinking about doing is meeting at Hopkins and just use Hopkins as the home base moving forward. It's a bigger, less confusing space, I think. If you go to Home Depot, you don't know who's coming to see you. If you go to Hopkins, there's nobody else right. in the parking lot. Right. And, you know, I, I look forward to the day where this isn't necessary. But based on what I've seen driving around town, it still seems to be pretty necessary. Talk to Bobby Kamen, who used to be the head of the Mosquito Opt-Out Committee, which no longer exists. Because she had an arrangement with Firestone that they would take that five, 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 and they were very happy, and they said last year they'd be happy to do it. So great, thanks. That's good. And maybe you can pull her in to run that part of it on this event. <laughs> that would be good. Yeah, I will say later in the year we had the folks at um, Gardner Supply. They had a take back your containers for oh, yes. flowers and other things. Yeah. Kathy and I went and we helped with that. 
So there's Staples had done some work with that. East Hampton Savings Bank had done some work with um, shredding and taking away uh, paper. So there are a number of different groups around town who do this. I know like um, Target um, accept uh, car seats, children car seats, and see if we can ask them to be part of this. Yeah. Because it's like you, you cannot throw them away. You cannot, you know, you have to throw them away. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Right. So I will start moving on that. And the first thing I'll do is I'll send an email to um, our friends at Solid Waste Solutions and see what they can do for us. So, Jane, um, I'm just wondering, is it an annual thing that Solid Waste bids on running the Hadley Transfer Station? It's a three-year contract. Do you know what year this is? Okay. Why? Uh, just because I'm wondering, like last time when we did the request for bids, did you have more than solid waste competing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But we have the, is working well or not? I don't know. I don't use the transfer station. That's one of the problems. Out of a town of 21 households, 700 households use transfer station. So does it? make them a lot of money but it's enough and that's why the cost of the bags goes up because they have they have to pay to have it hauled out all the rest of the things if the whole town could be converted to that but there are people who don't have the capabilities to take their trash there so you know the town offers people two options you can do it privately you can it's also privately through yeah. solid waste but it's right. less expensive by a whole lot and now that they have the, the recycling and the um, composting mm -hmm. over there. It, it would be worth, from the solar and battery perspective, if they're going to, that they have a lot of the flat area there, that would be good for batteries. It'd be good to see what they actually need in terms of space and how we might could define that in the next contract. I, I don't see that would be an issue. Because yeah. there's an awful lot of, of flat space to the uh, north and east of where the bins are currently. And is that under their lease terms right now or not? Yeah, they have the whole fence area. They've got, because they use it for their hauling also. It's not just Hadley uses it. Solid waste has their people bringing stuff in. Okay. I think that will be a topic Mm -hmm. for future discussion with this group because I think trash and cleanup and all of this mm -hmm. is just, mm -hmm. it's about to explode mm -hmm. as a real um, issue in this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, are there any items not anticipated at the time of posting the agenda? Mm -hmm. Public comment. Please. I still have a big question when it comes to this solar. Um, has finance committees, select board, have they gone about put numbers together within the past couple of years of knowing of what our uh, kilowatt usage is as to what it would overall for the year, what our spend for our electric bills are to justify a $4.3 million solar field, not including the batteries, knowing that they're going to be no longer any good after 20 years and we have to worry about disposal of these solar panels, has these committees or boards actually find down the numbers as to how much for all of our municipal buildings, how much is our electric bills that we're actually spending for taxpayers? And is it really worth it to putting us in the hole for 20 years for four, because that's how much the note's going to be, is for 20 years, for $4.3 million, not including the batteries, okay. of what it actually costs the town. Right. It's an expensive project. The numbers that I presented last time showed that we would make a net profit every year on the electricity that we saved. After 20 years, after we pay after no. No. Every year, there's a well, positive. First of all, a third of it comes back as, a, as from the IRS immediately as, as a tax credit. Okay. 
after that, the utility is willing to pay significantly more than the current amount that that electricity is worth because they are incentivizing solar, which is a certain amount per watt that they pay. They are incentivizing putting solar on a landfill, which is another incentive that they pay. Mm -hmm. And they are incentivizing municipalities owning solar, which is another payment stacked on top of the subsidy that they pay every month toward our solar, toward the energy that we produce. So because of all those sources of income, the town will earn about $2 million in profit over what they would if they just keep paying their electric bills. And how much time is that? $2 million and how much time? That is over the life of the project, which is 25 years. And you are correct that the numbers I presented did not represent the battery costs, but there's an additional incentive stacked on top of those that other stack I just talked about that basically pays for those battery costs. And the answer to your first question is the town is sort of waiting until we're actually ready to go to pull together the numbers because it's not just an easy thing. We have like, I was amazed when we did the studies, we have like, I think it's 40 different buildings. In oh, no. oh, I, I don't think about it, but we have all the pumping stations and we have all the water things. And we, mm -hmm. So getting somebody in town hall to do that is a real task. And if they have to be current, there's no need to do them today if we don't need them till September yeah. or whatever. And so. Peter, as part of the energy reduction plan to become a green community, we dove into that and we had people pulling all the bills together. It was really pretty amazing with all the different bills and all the costs involved. We have some of it. Yeah, It I seems pretty that. trustworthy. So we have that. Um, we have never taken it forward to the finance committee. We have never taken this forward to the select board because this is kind of coming from a couple of different directions at us, like the select board is looking at it, finance committee is talking about it, and we are talking about it as well, with Michael actually focused on a plan for putting it at the transfer center. And I'm, I'm happy to go over those numbers with you one-on-one -on -one if you'd like to see how they work. Um, they do, they are basically a composite of all the electricity that the town uses is added up and I don't have those numbers in front of you. That is the target for the size of the of the of the site that, that's being done. Well, you want to go probably up 10% because the kilowatts always being charged higher and higher. The power company is charging us more and more. So you I'm not talking about the 10%. cost right now. I'm talking about the amount of wattage that the town uses in a month. Right. Is what we're scaling this to be. And you're right, it probably should be at least 10% more because there will be more usage. And the price will go up, and that's the other way that this product, that this project becomes positive economic force for the town, is that those electricity costs and income are fixed, and the cost of electricity is going to rise over that twenty-five years. You would still be able to get that information because of the size of that solar field for the disposal of those. We, we I, I'm happy to show you those those disposal right. feet. Because so that's, you know, after 25 years with that many panels, it's going to cost a lot of money. The panels are not a huge cost to dispose of. And, and there's, because they're, they're glass and aluminum primarily. And both of those are fairly, aluminum is highly sought after. Aren't they made out of silicone too? Isn't there kind of silica inside those solar panels? Yes. Okay, and isn't that silica actually a hazard? It's made out of sand, right? I don't even know. Yeah, that's, so it's not a hazard. The battery is a hazard, and you need to figure out exactly what that disposal cost is, because that's 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 a real cost. But the and panel, safety. Absolutely. But the panels are not an expensive cost to dispose of. Thanks for your question. And these are things that we're exploring all the time. And thanks for taking the lead on that. All right. Uh, anybody else for public comment? Okay. 
what Kathy and I will do is we'll figure out the note taker for the next meeting. Um, Marion is away. And there was a loss in her family or a friend of the family. And Kelly is away. And Kathy is away actually visiting somebody for a family wedding. Um, we expect that everybody will be back next month. Our next meeting is March 14th. The day before the event of the barn. Yes. There you go. Yes. All right. Um, I move that we adjourn this meeting. Can I have somebody second that? Second. Second. And we are adjourned.